God reveals himself in the Old Testament, little by little, by meeting different people. He meets Abram, and then to Abraham, and he tells Abraham, listen, Abraham, I'm going to give you all kinds of descendants. Do you remember this story? For those who were here last time, even not, he says, look out in the stars. Your descendants are going to be all like this, more than you can count. I'm going to give you a land. It looks like all these things are coming through. So you look in Genesis, though there are major obstacles, God overcomes all the obstacles. So you have babies, no, descendants, I can't have getting it pregnant. She can't get pregnant. No, yes, you will. Well, what about this? So that's not going to happen. Yes, you will. I'm too old. No, you're not. God just overcomes all their obstacles, all their doubts. When we get to the end of Genesis, things are looking up because God has worked it such that all the way he works through Joseph, who went, man who was killed, almost killed by his brothers, goes to prison, uh, uh, the well, he comes out, and then he eventually goes to prison. And when we talked about this, at the end of Genesis, he ends up, he's, man, he's, on, he's on cloud nine because now he's ruling over all the granaries. And when his brothers come to him and say, dude, we're starving, Joseph has the authority in his office to give them food. So the end of Genesis, the covenant looks like it's coming fulfilled. The covenant that God made through Abraham, it's good, except they don't have land yet. They don't land yet. But then when we end the very book of Genesis and we get to the very beginning of Exodus, things change. It starts to look like the covenant's over. It looks like everything's failed. It looks like the covenant's coming to a close because we see, in, uh, turn your Bibles to Exodus. When we get there, when we get to Exodus 1, the Israelites, are these Hebrew people have now grown up and grown up, and it looks as if nothing's going to happen because now they're just stuck in slavery. So there's a lot, a lot of people, a lot of descendants, but who gives a rip because we don't have land to go to when we're stuck in slavery. So it looks like things have failed, but they haven't. Let's look this morning at Exodus chapter 2. We learn at the very end of Exodus chapter 1 that the Pharaoh of the time, Pharaoh in Hebrew means great house. It's like saying the White House today decided to raise taxes. They, they wouldn't do that. But imagine if, like we said, the White House, that's what Pharaoh means, the great house. Uh, you can say the king of or em, the leader of Egypt. But he was trying to kill the firstborn sons of the uh, Hebrews because they were coming too numerous. And so that the background story is they're already in danger. Not only, not only are they stuck in Egypt and they don't have a land that God promised Abraham, now the descendants who are many, now they're starting to be killed off. I mean, it really looks like the covenant is coming to a dead end. It looks like it's going to fail. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 1, do you have it when you say amen? That's how the room has it. I'm glad you're looking. Good. Now, there's a man from the house of Levi. Levi, Levi, at Hebrew, uh, means it's one of the priestly lines, Levi. And he married a Levite woman. So this is a thoroughgoing priestly family. And the woman conceived and bore a son. Now, that's danger because right before then, in chapter 1, we learned that all the babies are being killed. And so she's scared. She saw that he was a fine baby. That is, he could make it. It was a long time. And she hit him for three months. And, of course, she's holding the baby. You know, be quiet, be quiet, until the baby is too big and he makes too much noise and he's, too, he's very obvious there's a baby. So what does she do? Verse 3. When she could hide him no longer, she got a, and your translation might say something like a basket or papyrus basket. Does it say that? Something like that? Uh, the Hebrew word only shows up two times in the Old Testament here and in Genesis, way back in Genesis, because it's the same Hebrew word for ark. Uh, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, almost everyone I've ever heard teach and prop, uh, preach and, and teach on that subject is mistaken. And the images you've seen, um, the ark itself is not a boat. The ark was never intended to be driven. It doesn't have a propeller. It doesn't have oars. It's not meant to, it's not a boat. It's a box. Uh, baby Moses is not put inside of a boat. A little baby, you know, there's a little motor on there. It's not a motor. There's not like, so that's why I chose this picture, because the picture is better. It's much more like a basket. And then she, and we'll see in a second, she takes it and puts tar and stuff around it and make it water repellent. And that's exactly what the ark, the Noah's ark was supposed to be. Noah's ark was something just floated. It was not driven. It was to float on top of the water until it finally just landed. And, that's a, and there was a b movie that came out called Noah, and they actually got it right. Uh, but every other people do it mistakenly. They think it's, it's not a boat. So she puts them in an ark. She puts them in this box, and it says uh, in verse 3 that she plastered with bitumen and pitch. She makes it water repellent. They don't have the ancient spray that you could spray on. Remember, you've seen that infomercial? Remember that? Huh? Yeah, Flex Seal. Yeah. Thank you. She didn't have Flex Seal. I'm trying to get royalty. Every time I say the word Flex Seal in a sermon, Flex Seal, Flex Seal. She didn't have that, so she gets 
stuff. She makes a water pellet, and she put the child in it. She placed him among the reeds of the bank of the river. Reeds grow on the shallow part of water, and that's exactly why she does that. It's one of the difficult parts of teaching and preaching from this text is that if you've seen movies about this, like The Prince of Egypt, do you ever see an animated movie? Steven Spielberg produced it. It's a great movie and a great soundtrack. It's really powerful. It's just that they took a lot of freedom a lot of freedom with the text. And so if you've seen movies like that, it's very, very easy for us to read into the text something that's not there. And so in the story and the Prince of Egypt movie, that's not what happens at all. He puts, she puts him in this cage and she kind of kicks him off to the curb, boop, right in the middle of the water. He goes down the river and it's all wild and crocodiles and alligators are trying to eat him in boats. It's crazy. That's not at all what happened. Moses' mom takes baby Moses, who right now doesn't have a name, and she puts him in very carefully in a water repellent thing and puts him among the reeds exactly where people come down to bathe or wash their clothes or whatnot or even go on the, the, the edge of the water. That's exactly what she does. And then on top of that in verse 4, she has the sister watch. Well, she, the mom's too, uh, too conspicuous, so she backs up. And she tells the little daughter, hey, watch out for him. Make sure he's okay. He st- she stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Verse 5, wouldn't you know it, shucks, of all the places one of the daughters comes to bathe, of course it's on purpose. Moses knew that. Moses' mom knew this. A daughter of the Pharaoh. Now, again, in the movie Prince of Egypt, you see it looks like the royalty. and There's only like two or three daughters of the Pharaoh. In the real world, they would have had several hundred concubines. One ancient Pharaoh purportedly had up to 900 kids. My man was busy. And so... They had a lot of babies, and so it is actually very, very likely that the, the head pharaoh would have not have even known his own children at all, at all. Some may not even hardly met him before. And so this is not an issue of all of a sudden he came, she, the, the pharaoh's daughter came straight from his courtroom, as it were. No, I mean, they could have grown up their entire lives and never met. Uh, certainly possible. Nevertheless, it's important because she comes down to bathe, and her attendants walk beside her to make sure she doesn't need anything. She's out there, and she's bathing. Well, she saw the basket among the reeds, and she sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying. She took pity on him. That's good news. Instead of killing him, and the mom knew that, right? Moms typically don't want to kill babies. That's a different sermon, but typically they don't. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then out of nowhere, the sister pops up. Hey, what's up? Can I go get you a wet nurse? I know the perfect woman who can nurse that baby. The Pharaoh's daughter says, sure thing. So the daughter goes and gets Moses' mom. The Pharaoh's daughter says, hey, I tell you what, if you will nurse this baby, I'll pay you. This woman got paid to nurse her own baby. That's, that, that's it. Jen, that's your next job. This is, you didn't know this is a job placement sermon. So they ter- and, the, and when she grew up, she brought him, uh, now verse 10. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. So that's probably around two to three years old around two to three years old, basically kind of like going into preschool, then Moses' mom would have taken the child back to Pharaoh's daughter so he could be raised, of course, not be killed. And that's the point is he's being protected and not being killed by the Pharaoh. And then she named him, uh, in Hebrew, Moshe. Uh, she said, because I drew him out of the water. That's, it's kind of hard to explain that. Uh, there's two different languages going on. The, the Egyptian woman spoke Egyptian. And in Egyptian, the letters that we say M-S, uh, it's their word for boy or son. And, and it's also like another word for, um, for child. But anyway, so it means boy. But in Hebrew, when a Hebrew said that Egyptian word, it sounded like Moshe. Moshe means to be drawn out. So it's a Hebrew pun on an Egyptian word. Uh, you're welcome. No extra charge for that. But it's also a big metaphor because, right, Moses will be the person God will use to draw them out out of Egypt. He will be the rescuer. And that's why that name becomes significant. It's not just because he's drawn out of the water, but he will be the hero, the rescuer of the story. Right now, it sure doesn't look like it, but he will be. Now, keep going. We're not done yet. Verse 11. Now, one day, this is years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. In the movie The Prince of Egypt, he don't know anything about, they don't know their, he doesn't know their kinfolk. But in the Bible, yes, he does. He knows who his people are. He saw the forced labor, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinfolk. And this is the first time in the story we see that Mose, or Moses, cares about his people. He's starting to care about their condition. That matters for the story. Verse 12, he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, and the Hebrew word, your translation might say he killed. The Hebrew word is that he beat him or struck him. You can use the word killed. It's unsure if Moses meant to kill him 
or just meant to beat the snot out of him. But he does kill him because what does he do with the body? What does he do with the body? He hit him in the sand, that's right. As all people do when they've done something wrong, they go and tell the police, right? No, they hide up the evidence. And when he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting. Now, what's weird about that is, what's weird, in the ancient world, certainly Egyptians had the legal and moral right to beat their slaves. That's how they saw it. Because of property. You could beat your slaves all day long. In fact, you could beat someone else's slaves if they were do, not doing their work. And if you beat the other slaves so much the other slave died, you didn't go to jail, you didn't get killed yourself, you had to pay the slave owner money for a lost, wage, lost uh, work. That's it. So for Moses to say, what are you doing? Stop, would have been very weird in the ancient world. That, that just makes no sense. The point of that in the text is Moses is starting to care for his people. And he can't stand it. He's starting to bubble up with this is not right, it's not right. The problem is, the way he tries to solve the problem is by killing the Egyptians one at a time. That's exactly what God does not want him to do. So, he goes out the next day, he's chilling, and two Hebrew people are fighting with each other, and he says, why are you doing that? Why are you trying to hit your fellow Hebrew? And he says, who made you God? Who made you? You're not my daddy. That's what kids say. That's exactly what he said. Who made you my ruler and judge? That's a little irony there, because... In a little bit, God will, in fact, make him ruler and judge over the Israelite people, just not yet. Do you mean to kill me as you kill the Egyptians? Now, then Moses was afraid and said, uh-oh, this thing is known. It's all over Instagram. When Pharaoh heard it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh, and he settled in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. We'll go there in just a second. Something that strikes me in this first part of the text here, it's worth reflecting on, is that not only in Moses, but the rest of our lives, Old Testament, New Testament, and today, God is always able to raise up and equip the people he wants to raise when he wants to do it. Please don't go too fast for that. He is always able to do that. Jesus does the same thing when he picks his, uh, chooses the apostles. He doesn't say, Peter, man, I want to start a fishing ministry, and you're a fisherman. Let's do this. He said, i got to hold the ministry in charge. Jesus gives on-the-job training. Sometimes he does use people in their skill sets. Sometimes he does. My, some say, Rod, you're really good with wood, and you're really good, so because of that, I want to get you to raise you up to make sure you can make things for the people. That might bless them. He might say, you're really good. Jen, you love horses. Because you love horses, I'm going to start a horse ministry. But maybe not. Maybe he uses something else that's not your skill set. But whatever it is, God is able, and his timing and the way he wants, he is able, and that includes you raising you up there's a study that was just many studies demonstrate this that when you're in a crowd of people and things go wrong let's say there's a bad car accident or uh some uh, they've done studies where women get attacked in public like in new york and so forth and a crowd sees it there's a psychological they, they, i can't remember the exact title right now there's a there's a, a phenomenon where people don't call for help they don't call 911 because everyone assumes someone else is doing it and so they tell people when you're, and that's what I tell people too, if you see something, they say, see, see something, if you see something, say something. That's because of that phenomenon. If you see something that looks bad, call, tell someone. Don't just say, I bet, I, surely everyone else is noticing this. Well, see, in the church, as Christians, we do the exact same thing. There's so much need, not only in Hill Church, and there is, in our communities. In Kiwani, in Sheffield, in Cambridge, or whatever, at Walmart, there's so much need. And our default stance, if we're not careful, is someone else has got it. One of the things that helped me years ago, and I still struggle a little bit, but years ago, clearly that switch went from, I don't talk to them about Jesus or church, switched over to say something. They may never, ever, ever be asked. I ask people all the time now, do you go to church anywhere? Do you practice a religion? Where do you go? Not like, how my name is David, you go to church. But at some point in the conversation, I'm going to try to bring it up. How many times have I, because you, as pastor, you know how many times I've heard people go, I don't know, no one's ever asked me. Like, Woo, this is your good day. If I just close my mouth, someone else, surely, surely someone's asked them before. That's a false assumption. Someone else is going to call 911. Why would you assume that? Not only can God raise people up because he's going to raise Moses up, and he does raise him up in just a little bit. He's going to see he raised, he's able to do that and equip them with the skill sets they need to do for the kingdom. The people he tends to choose to use are people that other people think are powerless. 
Like they have no seemingly um, social or economic status. Like, of course they would choose that person. Of course God would choose because she's so pretty or he's so handsome or she's so intelligent or he's so this. And of course, no. God chooses to use people that other people are like, him? Her? Do you know their past? Come on now. Do you know what they've been through? Moses was a murderer. Moses was a murderer. How many of you had a past you wish other people didn't know about? You hope they don't find out. I got two hands up, sister and brother. Man, I hope they don't find out. Oh, Lord, I hope they don't find out what I did. You are in good company. And the rest of you, you're welcome here. But for everybody else, you're in good company because God says, I like using those people. And I could tell you, I don't have time for the sermon. I can tell you through all the biblical narratives, the people God used person to person, the apostle Paul help people get killed. I mean, I can on and on it goes. But God prefers to use people, other people think are powerless, and even have a past. No, David, because Christians are a bunch of goody two-shoes. That's why I don't go to church. You think you got it all together. What? No, we don't. Some people might, but I don't. And God likes, this is why non-Christians get so mad about this. If your God's real right now, right now, and he's just show up right now, why is he not feeding everybody right now? Think about that. Jesus could have walked around and go, goo, 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 making fish and bread appear in their belly. Doo, 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 doo. Every time you walk near Jesus, you go, oh, that was good. I feel full. That's got to be deep dish pizza. I mean, I just feel better. Instead, that's not at all. If you've ever read the Gospels, that's not what Jesus did. That's not what God does. That's not what he does. Sometimes he does miracles. Yes, sometimes he gives miracles. Sometimes. But in general, God prefers to use people. He could just make houses pop into existence in poor communities. That's not what he does. He says, go build it. Go build it. Go build the shelter. We need people who can build things. He can make fish and bread and whatever, God's favorite oatmeal cream pies, and their bellies to appear, he says, or just go bake them. Go make them. Go fish and go feed the people who need it. Well, uh, David, I just want to grow up my life. I just need to go to counseling, whatever. I'm just going to keep praying. God's going to make sure I get all that trauma done. I'm just going to well, keep praying. Good. Or the way God prefers to use it, using other people to help you. Go talk to a therapist. Go talk to a counselor. Talk to some. Get a friend and so forth. What about ministries? That's why this Hill Church and any good church has outreach ministries. God wants to use us, people just like you and me. I cannot overemphasize. That is just good, good biblical theology. God prefers to use us to do what he wants. Instead of us sitting back going, God's just going to call 911. That's what God's going to do. Let's just sit back. He might. God prefers to use us. We see the exact same thing in the New Testament. People that you think are going to write off, like you'd run, man, there's no way God's going to use them. Those are the exact kind of people he likes to go to. Paul says it this way to the Corinthian church. Think about the circumstances of your call, brothers and sisters. He means, listen, Hill Church, think about the time you became a Christian. Think about the time you, that's what he's talking about. Think about your circumstances. Not many of you are wise by human standards. He means like really educated. Not many people became a Christian, did so because you had good theology degrees. Is that true? Most people don't have big, not many of you are powerful. That's true. Not many were born in a privileged position. Lord knows I wasn't. But God chose what the world thinks foolish to shame the wise. God chose the, what the world thinks weak to shame the strong. That's what God did. God chose what is low and despised in the world, what is regarded as nothing, to set aside what is regarded as something so that no one can boast in his presence. He is the reason you have a relationship with Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification that means to be like him in holiness and redemption so that it is written, let the, no one, uh, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now I chose this picture of a little boy at orphanage. I could have chosen any other picture you want. But oftentimes you might go to orphanages and go, there's no way they'll be used for God's kingdom. Or they're not going to be a big deal, right? They're too poor. Maybe they're uneducated. They don't know what's going on. From the outside of the world standards, that's precisely the kind of thing we look at as we already start judging people. And they've been studies. It's under a second. It's in the milliseconds you and I have determined ahead of time a whole list of criteria we've already judged a person. By the way, they look right away. And God looks at the people that most people look at and write them off and goes, whoo, I'm going to use them. I'm going to use them. If that picture were me as a kid that same age, as a skinny, pale, 
a red-headed boy from Mississippi with a strong southern accent who didn't have a very high reading comprehension. You'd probably write him off. I probably would have too. And who would have known? God can look at the people that we go, well, eh. God says, that's the one I want. For you're so busy writing off. God likes to use that. Look at the Moses story. The same kind of thing happened here. The guy comes up. His mom tries to get him saved. He's almost killed. God can raise up whomever he wants, and he likes to use us in the process. Instead of just going, poof, you're going to disappear from Egypt, poof, disappear into Canaan. Boom, look at that. I just transported you. Telekinesis. No, I'm going to raise up person for you. Moreover, not only does he raise up people, it looks like everything's failed. He can lead people right to what looks like a failure. It looked like God was going to rescue people through Moses. Oh, this is, he's risen them up. He's getting mad about a Hebrew. He's going to chop him down. Well, then Moses, what do he do? He runs off. He takes off. He's, he looks like a failure. Looks like the same happened on the cross when Jesus died on the cross. It looked like God the Father was going to raise up and rescue his people through Jesus. And what happens? Jesus dies. It looks like an abject failure. What do you do? What do you do when it looks like that event your life has failed? What do you do? Because if you know your Bible, you know how these stories end, right? So one thing you might say is, so I get encouraged to think that it looks like all has failed and over and God has forgotten me. He's forgotten his covenant. He's not good anymore. That's one option. That's one option some people do. They give up the faith. They get out of here and say, forget it, forget it. I wouldn't do that. I think that's a bad idea. But what do you do when the very person who looks like he's the hero of the story is running away from the very thing we thought? This is how we're going to do it. God said, no, no, no. I'm not asking the guy to go around and start killing all the Egyptians one by one. That's not how I'm going to do it. Well, then it's over. My people are stuck in slavery way over there. And that's what we can do in life, too. I'm still stuck in this situation, this horrible marriage, this horrible job. I can't get the check I need. I can't get over this addiction. I can't get past the wounds and grief. I'm just stuck. Forget it. I mean, it looked like, remember Luke 24, the disciples walk on the walk to Emmaus, and he says, Jesus walks up. What do you think you're doing? Hey, we thought this guy was going to redeem Israel, but oh well. You think that's the end of the story. And from inside the story, they have reason to think it's the end of the story. We Christians have to keep saying that's not the end of the story because I know how stories end, and God writes the end of the story. And we would be duped if you looked at the story and stopped here. And Moses would have been too, and so the ancient Israelites. They would have been duped. He goes on in Exodus chapter 2, verse 16. Verse 16. He says, now he goes to a well. And a well in the ancient world, in the Bible, whenever you read well, you have to think a little love story. You hear little birds chirping. A little love theme starts playing. Because whenever there's a well, almost always some boy, girl, man, woman, someone gets married. Happens all the time. Like even in John 4, Jesus shows up at a well in Samaria, and there is a Samaritan woman. Anybody read that? John 4, Samaritan woman. There's always a woman male story somehow at a well. And that's what happens here. So he goes to a well, and verse 16, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. But some shepherds came and drove them away. The shepherd, poor shepherds, bad guys. Moses got up and came to their defense, and he watered their flock. Get out of here, shepherds. Get out of here, shepherds. When they returned to their father, Ruel, or Jethro, he said, how is it you've come back so soon today? I said to my son when he's cutting the grass, how are you back in 10 minutes? How did that happen? How'd that happen? How you, you, how'd you water all these shepherds? Come on, girls. Did you not finish the job? Well, they have to defend it. He said, hey, an Egyptian helped us against these shepherds, and he even drew water for us, and he watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, where is he? Come on, man. Why did you leave him? Invite him to come have lunch with us. That's a good Mediterranean thing to do. And while he's eating bread over lunch, he marries a woman. I'm kidding. Probably some time that goes by, Moses, Moses agrees to stick around and his daughter, Zipporah, and marries, marries Zipporah in marriage. And later on, she bears a son, and he named him Gershom. For he said, I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. The Hebrew word for foreigner or resident alien is Ger. And, so, and that's exactly what it is. So Moses is very aware that he is not from there, that his home is somewhere else. Look in verse 23. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. 
God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. You notice all those verbs? He listens, he listens, he listens, he listens. Now something that's so weird to me in this text is God's listening and listening. And we think, okay, God, what are you going to do right now? You're going to cut off all the pharaohs? You're going to send some plagues? What are you going to do right now? No, what God chooses to do is thousands of miles away, he's going to raise a guy to bring him back. God responds to the Israelites' cry by raising a believer thousands of miles away at the exact time he wants. That's how our God rolls. Things that just do not make sense to me at all. Why would God, if God wants to rescue me here, why would he move me over there? Or why would he have that person over there move me over the, or that person here? I don't understand why God said that's how I, that's how I do it. It, it is not a sign that God is oblivious because he's not heard, he's not responded to your prayer request yet. You know what oblivious means for the French? Oblivion it means to be completely unknown. As if God is completely, you know, we do that facial expression like, oh, God is not oblivious about your situation. Wait. Wait. He's not oblivious. I have to tell myself that all, I mean, many times in my life I've had to say that. He's not oblivious. You've got to wait. You've got to wait. At the exact right time, and it might be a 5,000 miles. Why in the world would God do that? We're going to some tragedy here in Illinois, or, or, let's, or let's do better yet. Way up in North Canada, God raises up a person to go all the way down to Mexico to solve their problem. God said, yep, that's what I want to do, because I want that person who's born in Canada. Yep, that's right. God uses these natural events, people's free will, to orchestrate all these perfect things. I like how the professor says it this way, Terence Friedham. He says, the long period of waiting in Egypt then has been not due. It's not due to some God, divine quietism. God's just asleep. God doesn't care. That's not why it's happened. But to God's waiting for the right configuration of human and natural events to put a new level of activity together. That's what God, at the right time, at the right place, right then. Paul says it this way in Galatians 4, 4. He says, at the right time, in the right season, God sent forth his son Jesus. The right time. Now imagine this picture on the screen right here. That's, that's, that's my son yesterday. I'm kidding. No, I, I, um, imagine for a second I said that. This, I, I, this is imagine for a second I'm talking to my son. And I say, all right. In 11 years, I want to take a picture of you at that particular lake with this particular camera. And I want to get a shot where it's just before the millisecond before you touch the water. Now, imagine I'm talking to a baby. Baby's like, what's up? And I, but, but why, Daddy? Why wait 11 years? Because I want a picture when you're 11 years old. That's the picture I want. Well, can you speed up the process? It's possible. I don't want to. I want you to grow up. In natural, quote unquote, natural ways, when you turn a certain age, I have something in mind. And it can only happen if all these other pieces move to this exact time, second, and place. And then it'll happen. That is precisely what God is doing with you. Why in the world wait all this time? He's, God might say, Diane, I want you to wait there for 23 more years. Because in the 24th year, I want you to meet this one other person. And they've been waiting 36 years. And that person knew this other person who remained six months. And that person met so-and-so. Well, why wait? Just trust me. There's a particular Canadian I want you to meet in 23 years. And the world to come, you'll see all the pieces. But right now you won't. I don't care. Can you trust me? Right now. You might say, Jill, if you'll wait six more weeks, this is going to just wait. It might be 60 years. Just wait. I've got 5,000 other people I'm also working with and through all these pieces and the right time to get the exact shot I want. Trust me, all the pieces will come together. They will come together. And we can be convinced that they're not coming together. Right before I got this position here as pastor, I was one of the darkest times of my life. And I really, really struggle that God might be, he's, he might be just done with me. Might be done with me in ministry. I thought maybe called to something else. 
Maybe that's exactly right. Maybe the timing is too long. Maybe he's called me out of ministry. I couldn't find that right church. Just the right thing I thought was a good fit for me that the church I could come and corrupt. And I found one. So I'm so glad to be here. I, I absolutely, if you can relate to this, I know exactly what it feels like to be impatient. I know it feels like to throw your hands up and go, what in the world is going on? And God, and it seems to me in the story of Moses, why raise up someone thousands of miles away at the exact God said, that's the exact person I want to know. Now, Moses might have ran off there and been so discouraged and say, that's all, forget it. I'm in, a, I'm in a situation, forget it. That's not true. Listen, if I brought all this together this morning, I would say when all hope seems gone, God simply has not forgotten you. You cannot go to a land too far away that he can't rescue you. You can't. He is not done wanting to use you for the kingdom. You don't know what I've been through, David. You don't know, I don't know what you're doing. That's fine. He can pluck your rear end right out of the mess you put yourself in. He can pick you right out of the mess you put yourself in and say, get back on the road. Here's exact, I've got something in mind for you, and you've got to hold on and do it his way so the kingdom of God gets accomplished. And I said this last week's sermon, if we're trying to, oh, he's not real because I've suffered too much, you've got to get over that. God's not trying to rescue you from suffering. He's trying to get his will accomplished. And since he's a good God, we can trust him with that. But God has not forgotten you. No, David, I ran too, I ran too far away. I'm hiding from my past. You can hide. You think you're hiding. Nope, you can't. I ran all the way down to Mexico. Oh, God can't see Mexico. That's silly, right? It's nonsense. He can pick you right up whenever he wants, wherever he wants. You, even you. And maybe he doesn't need to pluck you out of Mexico. Maybe he needs to pluck you out of sleepiness. Maybe he needs to pluck your ear in out of laziness to say, why are you not talking to everybody you know about Jesus? Do you know how many people around this community don't know Jesus? What in the world are you waiting on? Maybe that's what he's plucking you out of. Maybe if it's despair, maybe it's just meism. Well, I don't know what it is. I don't know. Maybe he's plugging you out of something that says, I'm not done with you. I've got a kingdom of God I'm trying to get established here. And this chase and the real, I'm so busy, all this nonsense. What are you doing? Don't run off. Say, God, what do you want me to do? 